Thank you for joining us for the Game Dev Show. I'm Luke Greenaway. Uh, this week I'm joined by FPS, RPG, survival sim extraordinaire, creator of System Shock, Deus Ex, Thief. The accolades go on. It's uh, Warren Spector. How are you doing, Warren? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks uh, Thanks for having me. It's a, a nice break from uh, from development, you know? <laughs> I, bet. I bet. How are things up the other side? Uh, things are, are going really well. You know, I'm doing work down here uh, of my own, and there's a, another project going on in the Concord office. Uh, we have two, one in Austin, Texas, and one in, in Massachusetts. Their project is, uh, it's been announced, it's a, a pretty big deal. It's a, uh, a kind of an immersive sim set in one of the, the D&D uh, areas. Yeah. Uh, and we're working with Wizards of the Coast on on that. And I'm uh, I'm helping out as much as I can and where they'll let me and trying to ensure that, uh, frankly, not only that we make a, a great game, but that we make uh, a D&D game, which uh, mm. is one of my major motivating uh, factors. Yeah, because you're a big D&D player. Were you a big D&D player? I, I was, yeah. That was kind of my start in uh, in gaming. I played in a, a campaign, a D&D campaign, with a lot of rules that, you know, my group made up ourselves, which is kind of the genius of D&D. And uh, my, my first dungeon master was a guy named Bruce Sterling, who is, you know, along with Bill Gibson, one of the early great innovators in the world of, of cyberpunk. An interesting thing, I said we made up a bunch of our own rules, and that's part of the genius of, of Dungeons and Dragons that it's almost incomplete. It's like Gary mm. Gygax and Dave Arneson kind of backed into something that was totally genius, which is not making your rules so detailed that people can't deviate from them, but in fact, making them loose enough that players had to fill in gaps. And once you start making your own thing, you're never leaving. So people would play D&D forever because yeah. they had made the game their own by modifying the rule set in addition to creating their own environments, their own settings. And so, you know, I played in that adventure, that that campaign for about 10 years and it was amazing, you know. But it's where I, I learned the power of telling stories with someone as opposed to being told a story by someone. Bruce created the the skeleton of the of the story, but my friends and I who were, you know, playing with him really filled in the muscle and and skin and the overall direction of the of the adventure, which once I realized the power of that, it's kind of inspired everything else I've done over the last horrifying 38 years of <laughs> it's been a while i mean yeah that's definitely i definitely want to ask you about that later because it is that your games have this theme of being you have this world and it has been created but almost encouraging the player to approach every task and every challenge individually and within how they think they should do it but um you know before we talk about that it, it, with D D is I know that you worked at Steve Jackson's games uh, before you even ventured into video games. Was the D&D a big part of that? And what was it like? What did you learn there? D&D was a part of it, I guess, to the extent that um, when I interviewed with Steve, I was able to tell him that I was a huge fan, not just of Dungeons and Dragons, but of his work. I played a lot of, of the uh, meta games, uh, games, the little things that came in baggies you know, that cost, what was it, two ninety five, I guess, and played the fantasy trip, his his role-playing game, and games like Ogre and Illuminati uh, and a bunch of games that he created. That helped me get a job, but I think that what was more important was that as an amateur, I had created my own game systems, my own rules, mm -hmm. and my own RPG it was a World War II uh, game, you know, where the, the players were people uh, who were in special operations executive, which was a British World War II uh, spy agency, basically. And what I did was 
kind of what I, I still did later. I took a little bit from, from one game and a little bit from another and a little bit from another and massed them together and held them to gl- together with some glue that, you know, my own creation and ended up with something original, which is, you know, not to get ahead of myself here, <laughs> but that's kind of what I do now. I'm not, you know, like Will Wright or, or someone like uh, Richard Garriott, who are what I call empty hard drive designers. <laughs> I, I just take stuff from other people <laughs> and mash them together. And assume yeah. if you mash enough together and you do it skillfully enough, yeah. uh, you'll come up with something original and new that, that other people haven't done and players haven't seen. So I think creating my own system and playing Steve's games is what got me the job. <laughs> uh, honestly, I have no idea. He just took a huge chance on me. And, you know, it it worked out pretty well for me, certainly. And I think it worked out for him pretty well. <laughs> you know, I, my God, did I learn a lot from him. Flow charting solo adventures and critiquing games uh, that we were playing in a, a more sophisticated way than I had before. And working with him on GURPS, which was the generic universal role-playing system that, that he came up with, and realizing how powerful character creation was and you know, creating your own avatar. And frankly, he's going to get mad at me for saying this, but I learned a lot about what not to do or what I didn't <laughs> appreciate. Um, in, in GURPS, I always thought that the, the character creation was the best character creation system anybody had ever come up with. But Steve's approach to the actual in-mission play of the game was very detailed. It was almost like um, a miniatures game where you could only move a certain, you know, amount around a hexagon in one second intervals. And what it meant was that the simplest combat encounter 30 second encounter would take two hours to play. <laughs> and I was much more interested in the, I've said this before, in the, the role playing, R O L E of playing, as, uh, and not so much uh, in the R O L L uh, kind of, of role playing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, learning that was huge for me too, because I've carried that along with me ever since. Uh, in tabletop gaming, uh, when I went to TSR, and in uh, in the world of, of digital gaming as well, it's about you playing a role. Go figure. Yeah. Um, and that was mostly what I learned. But the other thing, I worked on a game called Tune. That it, it's amazing. It's still selling today. <laughs> and this is I, it, it shipped in 1984. Wow. Um, it was. It was exactly what it sounded like, a cartoon game. And uh, it started with a a manuscript that Greg Kostikian, another great designer, submitted as uh, his idea was, hey, let's put this in a magazine as kind of a throwaway. And I went to Steve and said, this is kind of genius. We, We need to do this. But Greg had written it in what was called SPI case format which was this, again, very detailed, very kind of tweaky uh, approach to role play. And I said, let's just jettison all of that and really recreate the feeling of being in a cartoon. So I started working on it. And uh, a guy named Alan Varney, who I I worked with on several projects, uh, another designer who worked at Steve Jackson Games, he and I sat down and worked on it together. And then Steve put in his two cents and we we shipped this funny, crazy, wacky change of pace game. It's a game you play while you're waiting for the rest of your gaming group to show up, not something you play <laughs> for hours and hours on end. And it worked out pretty well. I mean, it was really mm. well received. It established my reputation and uh, Alan's to some extent and resulted in lots of uh, of other wonderful opportunities, including the opportunity to go to TSR, where I got to work on AD&D stuff and, and a bunch of other things. Yes, it's surprising, the, especially the veterans of the industry. I would say 70% of our guests that we've had on 
attribute much of what they've learned coming into video games from D&D, from working on board games, from creating like player-led experiences, but within a rule set. And yeah, it's, it's fantastic to hear, obviously, that this has also had a great impact on you and your early career. You know, I, I, I always feel like everybody in, in the video game business should, you know, kneel down once a day and first <laughs> north to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and and say a little prayer of thanks to uh, Gary and Dave, because without them, I genuinely believe that without D&D, mm -hmm. none of us would have jobs. There would be no video game business. I mean, that may be a little bit of an overstatement, but I don't think it's much of one. You know, if you look back at the earliest days, there are kind of space adventures inspired by Star Trek and text adventures inspired by, you know, Tolkien, by D&D, &D, by way of Tolkien. And then there are, you know, role-playing games that were at first kind of, you know, retellings of people's D&D &D campaigns. That's a wonderful thing in a way. It, it certainly got this medium started. But one of the things that frustrates me pretty dramatically, actually, is here we are, you know, what, 40 years later, and we're still doing d, &D. <laughs> you know, from a, from a content standpoint, we really need to move beyond, you know, guys in chain mail and, you know, women in fur bikinis and, you know, kill the dragon and the evil orcs. Uh, I love it. You know. <laughs> What would you what would you propose? Do you think can you ever replace that? Can it evolve? Because I know like you've got the rule sets like constantly improving. I think we're on five E now, the rule set five E yeah, and yeah. because obviously you influence people who are coming into the industry now and you've come into the industry for the last like, you know, 15, 20 years and they'll look at what inspired you and your creative process and then they'll take that with them. And it's almost like D D like follows everyone because they hear about D D and how it's helped people creatively can you replace that sure i don't know that we need to replace it i mean sometimes i overstate to make my <laughs> well, yeah, there's nothing wrong with making fantasy games inspired by you know tolkien there's clearly something there that people respond to that speaks to them and the same thing for you know star wars star wars and star trek spoke to something in people that still has has power. Uh, so I'm not saying we shouldn't do that kind of game, but I think, you know, you're seeing already, and you have for a while, different sorts of games. You know, Lara Croft and Tomb Raider is not your traditional D&D &D heroine, I guess. Mm. And if you look at Last of Us and um, David Cage's games and Will Wright's games, you certainly see other kinds of things. And I, I hope you see that in, in my work, too. I mean, I remember System Shock. Uh, I, I remember sitting down with Doug Church, the unheralded secret master of gaming. And we were just saying, oh, my God, I'm so sick of making fantasy games. <laughs> and out of that, you know, we said, let's, let's just do a science fiction game. And System Shock came out of that. Mm -hmm. And then later on, well, significantly later on, I was sitting around and just holding my head in my hands and thinking, if I have to make another fantasy or science fiction game, <laughs> I'm going to shoot myself. What I, I said to myself at that point is, I want to make the real world role playing game. And while that ended up being a little too challenging, even today, we can't really do a real world role playing game where people, you know, they know how telephones work and they know how televisions work. And they know how cars work. And we can't simulate how a telephone works, which is also kind of pathetic if you think about it, but would be constantly thwarting players' expectations. So out of that, I kind of took that frustration and turned it into the setting of, of Deus Ex, mm -hmm. or the, the driving force behind Deus Ex, you know, set it far enough in the future that we wouldn't thwart players' expectations because we could say, well, that, that's not the way computers work in 2052. <laughs> Sorry. I hope Deus Ex 
and even thief to some extent, were almost responses to let's let's just not make another game where you're you're the last space marine between the Earth and alien invasion. You know, we've, we we never need to make that game again. So, but I think you see a lot of people kind of breaking out of the old school content, which is mm. all to the good as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I completely agree. I think a lot of that is from indie developers. Like, you know, I think AAA publishers have like this responsibility to say diplomats to their shareholders as well as their communities to create titles that are popular, right? And I think often you have to have like innovators often go against what's popular. Like you said, the, you know, there's, there has been a lot of fantasy games. There has been a lot of games where you are you are the last person trying to save the planet and it's it is really really good to see that especially over the last like five to ten years that actually people are like no like we should do this or we should and i think that's what's great about the medium is that you can actually parallels with D, but you can literally create anything within that within Absolutely. your imagination um yeah. you know one of the my big things i think it's important before you start working on a game that you can define your success criteria. There are lots of different ways to measure success. And in the AAA space, the primary measure of success is maximized revenue. And uh, in the indie space, uh, I think there's room for let's advance the state of the art. Let's do something no one's ever seen before. You know, let's make enough that we get to make another one. But maximum revenue generation isn't the only way of, of measuring success. But yeah. when you're in the AAA space, and I, I've been there, and you have two, three, four hundred people on a team, and your budgets are, you know, 50, 100 million dollars or more, taking chances is really hard and mm -hmm. you, you kind of have to sympathize with, with people in that space, with publishers in that space in particular. But in the indie space, we're in a really remarkable place. We have been, I mean, you said, you said it yourself uh, in the last five or so, 10 years, maybe we've been in a space where if you have an idea for a game, there are tools to make it. You know, we have game engines that, I mean, on system shock, we, on Ultima, on Underworld, we had to make the the engine ourselves every time. And now you just, you know, Unity, Unreal, yeah. right? It, there's a way to make any game you want to make. There are ways to reach an audience with it that didn't exist before. You know, you don't mm. have to go to a software, et cetera, or you don't have to go to a GameStop, though, you know that it's fine to do that, um, <laughs> but you can go to Steam. You can go to you know uh, GOG. You can you can go all sorts of places. There's a way to reach an audience, and there are so many business models now. There's a way to make money on it. You can take chances and have a chance of succeeding, and even maybe influencing what happens in the AAA space because there's a measure of a different kind of success that can be rolled back into a much larger game. We're in a really remarkable time. Um, it's a little frustrating to me that there are so many games that have a number after their name. That's kind of annoying to me. There are also like how many games? I mean, there are thousands of games that literally that come out every year and a lot of them are completely different. I always tell indie developers and young developers in general, their primary job is to make people forget that guys like me ever existed. You know, there's still an opportunity to change things. We're not a, a medium that is frozen in time and we understand it perfectly and we've done everything. You know, uh, it's just carry on, do new stuff, go, go, go. That, I think that's what's so great about it, right? Because like you said, like the platforms are available. And if you look at indies, the way they are influencing, it's incredible because like you've got modern communities that are creating genres. You know, you look at like MOBAs, like League of Legends and, you know, Dota. It came from a mod and that mod's now, you know, a multi-billion dollar 
like genre within our industry and then it's the same even with like minecraft and mojang you know like when they sold to microsoft and you read stories about you know there's sort of like three people and one of them outbid like jay-z and beyonce on their mansion in california apparently and you think that's like you know three people starting out in a bedroom creating minecraft and now and i, I love that 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 liberal you know, like approach to the industry where you can literally have creators anywhere who can apply their own perceptions and like their own skills to the medium. Those are the two primary examples of, you know, games that changed things that didn't come from uh, a huge team or an established designer. Again, there's the opportunity to change the world. Um, mm. That was something I can't speak for anybody else uh, at Origin or elsewhere. But when I was at Origin, I used to think to myself, we are going to change the world. It, it's <laughs> never going to be the same again. And I'm not saying that we did it at Origin, but video games literally changed the world. I mean, think about that. Again, I tell young developers a new medium comes along once or twice a century and you have the opportunity not just to make a living doing this, but to help form and grow and mature the first medium of the 21st century. How, yeah. how amazing is that? And that, that's always driven me, you know, over the years one of the reasons why I've probably survived for 38 <laughs> years uh, of this craziness, because Does, what we do is it's not ephemeral and it's not trivial. What we do, what we have always done touches, I mean, everybody in the world, you know, mm. pretty much everybody's a gamer now. That's because yeah. of the work we did mm. and we can continue to do. It's, it's just amazing to me, you know, yeah. and, and powerful and that what we've done is genuinely important. Yeah. Do you ever sit back and think oh, it's weird that you created DirtX? It's weird that you created System Shock and then that's, they've gone on to influence so many other titles. And yeah, how, I mean, yeah, it does it feel strange? Do you wake up some days and think we created that? Well, I'll answer that in just a second, but let me be clear. <laughs> I did not create those games. I get way too much credit for Thief. I mean, I was on that team for the middle year of a three-year development cycle. Okay. Mm. So the project was conceptualized without me. It was finished without me. I think I made a valuable contribution in the middle that affected how that last year went. But please, the team on Thief will just kill me if I take credit <laughs> Um, on, on System Shock, I was there at the beginning of, of that project. I mean, it, the way that happened was I was working on a game uh, idea called Alien Commander <laughs> using <laughs> the Wing Commander uh, technology. And Doug Church, again, the secret master of gaming, was conceptualizing a very similar game. And we, you know, he's he's a good friend of mine and there's nobody I respect more in, in game development. And we just talked one day and said, you know, we should put these ideas together and see what comes out of that. And uh, again, I contributed to that, but it would not have happened without Doug. And, mm -hmm. and he needs to get the credit. I've been, I've been trying to make that guy famous mm -hmm. since we worked on Underworld together. We'll have and him on the show. We'll get him on the show. He refuses. He just he, he won't do your show. There was one time we were, he was in my office, and this is true. He was in my office, and there were a bunch of journalists there, and they were all looking at me, and I was answering all these questions because I like talking and I love talking about games. I'm not trying to minimize my own contributions, <laughs> but I literally got up from behind my desk and jumped into Doug's lap and said, please talk to this guy too. He just refuses. So mm. I'm still on 
on, on a mission to make Doug famous, even though it bugs him that I do it. With Deus Ex, it was somewhat different. I started that project as the real world role playing game. I adapted that and wrote up the the ridiculous design document because I'm an over documenter for uh, shooter and troubleshooter, which is its next step. And then a little later on, before I joined Ion Storm, I was talking to guys at Westwood about doing the Command and Conquer role playing game. It was basically the same design document with the serial numbers <laughs> filed off. And then when when John Romero said, "Make the game of your dreams, the biggest budget you'll ever have, biggest marketing budget you'll ever have, and no creative interference," I jumped at that. I mean, who says no to that kind of opportunity? And so I, I started building a team to to make that game. The team is everything. You have to have a team that buys into an overall vision. And I will take credit for the vision. I will take credit for everything in the game sort of going through me. Mm. But I have to credit, I mean, Harvey Smith, the lead designer. I mean, um, yeah. Chris Norton, the, the lead programmer. Uh, Sheldon Picotti, the the lead writer, Jay Lee, the lead artist. The game would not have happened without them, and it wouldn't have been the same game. The way I think about it is I closed my eyes when we started that project and imagined what it was going to be when we shipped it. And when we shipped it, every detail had changed, but it was exactly the game I wanted to make. Uh, if, if you can see what I mean by that, yeah. it was true to the the pillars and the commandments that I wrote up. And I wrote them up. There were things at the high level that we were going to do, that the game was going to express. And there were commandments. I mean, there were rules that that I said, everything in this game is going to exemplify these pillars and are going to uh, abide by these rules. And the team, you know, that leads team totally bought off on that. I'm so proud of that team. And, you know, look at what, what came after that. You know, Harvey went on to make his own games, mm -hmm. uh, very much in the spirit of Underworld and System Shock and Thief and Deus Ex. And he runs his own team in his own studio now. And like, that to me is the big win. It's not even the you know, the, the game Deus Ex, it's that other people grew as a result of, of making that game and have gone off on their own and influence. You know, I was talking earlier about success criteria. And one of mine is, have you changed things? Have you, have you had an influence? Because as I said, the medium is not mature. And certainly 20 years ago, it wasn't. And one of the most rewarding things to me was after we shipped, it was at GDC, at, at the awards ceremony, in fact, where the Ion Storm Deus Ex team was sitting at one table and there was another team sitting at the table next to us. And I'm not going to tell you the studio or name the names of, the, of the, the game or anything like that. But when they found out who we were, they said, oh, man. When we played Deus Ex, we completely rethought the game we were making and just changed in midstream. <laughs> and there was another developer, a very well-known developer, who said when they, they saw Deus Ex, they rethought the way they design games. Mm. And there was another developer who said, I started my studio because of that game. And that's the important thing. It's not that Deus Ex was so great or... You know, I mean, it sold pretty well, but it wasn't a mega hit. And certainly other other people have come along and done what we did at least as well, if not better. It's that we kind of changed things. Mm. And that's really powerful. But to actually answer your question, <laughs> um, it, it freaks me out that people still talk about Deus Ex and still mm. care about it. I mean, yeah. 20 years later, People are still playing it and not just playing it. They're still arguing about it. Um, mm -hmm. Back when we shipped, another thing that I was really proud of that is still going on today is 
there was a dialogue going on among players. You know, at some level, I think games like Deus Ex and Immersive Sims in general are a dialogue between the designer and the player. It's about me saying, hey, here's a problem or here's a challenge or here's an idea. It doesn't matter what I think about it. What Mm -hmm. do you think about it? And they answer that question through their play choices. That's the power of this kind of game and something that other games don't do. You are not being told, here's what I think about climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, you are presented with a set of problems that might be caused by climate change. And then you have to decide how you're going to interact with that. At the time we shipped, and like I said, even today, people argue, how could you pick that end game? How could you play the game killing everything that moves and then, you know, reducing the world to a new dark age without the connectedness of the internet? And other people would say, well, that's the obvious way the world should be. That's the best ending for the world. It wasn't about how did you defeat the Mars monster. <laughs> it was about how should the world be. Yeah. And, and I, I love the fact that people are still, you know, arguing about that. There's one other example of that. I gave a lecture about it, immersive sims, actually, at the New School for Social Research in New York. Afterwards. You know, I was outside talking to people because I like talking about games and they were smart people. And they asked, you know, a bunch of them asked, hey, you want to go to a bar and get a drink? And I I never do this, but I went. (laughs) And there was a point where a fairly inebriated guy came over and sat down and said, I'm not going to try to do a drunk voice, but imagine a drunk voice. (laughs) Please do. No no way. Um, I'm not an actor. That's for sure. um, how could you make that right wing, you know, piece of junk? And, you know, I didn't know how to answer, but somebody else walked over also inebriated and said, right wing. It was left wing propaganda from, from the start. Oh, wow. And they were both right because mm. of how they played and how they interacted with the questions that the game was asking. Yeah. And that's pretty powerful to me, too. And I've always tried to think about games not as saying something or making a statement, but asking questions. That's what games can do that no other medium in the history of humankind has been able to do. Mm-hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, that means we have a moral obligation to do that, to ask yeah. players to think about stuff and decide for themselves how they feel about it. I love doing that. That's that's yeah. all I want to do, you know, for the rest of my life. Ask questions and see how people answer them. I think that's an amazing design philosophy um, and approach. I think um, it's really I want to, I'm going to dive into this a bit more a bit later um, because there are some things I'll ask you and specifically around like the responsibility of games and developers now compared to you know 20 years ago now that the reach is far greater but like touching on a point you made earlier like obviously you've had this incredible career you've got this incredible career and you've worked in a lot of you know for a lot of big publishers small developers like you know it's ea idos um do you have obviously i'm sure you enjoyed them all but do you have like a particular favorite (laughs) that you look back and you think yeah that was great that company that stands out? Well, every place I've worked has, you know, good and bad, right? Just sort of running through them. I've never been asked that before, so I I kind of have to (laughs) reform it here for a minute. Origin was a really special place. There was so much creative freedom there and so much sort of philosophical variety there. You know, Richard... One of the things I learned from him, it was kind of my graduate school. You know, Steve Jackson Games, my undergraduate degree in game development, working with Richard was was grad school. He really did want to empower players. I mean, think about Ultima 4, right, where, you know, the virtues, you have to decide who you're going to be in this world of Britannia. There was that. Chris Roberts wanted to make cinematic adventures. You know, we all had our own 
ideas about what games could and should be. And there was a camaraderie. I'm going to get in so much trouble. For <laughs> but, you know, when everybody's at the office at three in the morning and you're arguing about your philosophy is ridiculous. You know, <laughs> um, There's something bonding about that. We were all younger then and, you know, most of us didn't have families and it was easier. But Origin was really special. Uh, uh, like I said earlier, I looked around and said, you know, we're going to change the world. And I mean, I even had a specific instance of that where uh, Paul Nurath, the, the guy I'm working with now at Other Side, he came to Origin with a tech demo, nothing more than a tech demo of a first person perspective, fully textured, real time game engine, essentially. And I can't speak to what other people were thinking at that moment, but what I was thinking is the world just changed. No one has ever seen anything like this on the planet. And that kind of thing happened at Origin. It was amazing. I thought I was going to retire from that company and, you know, get the gold watch and everything. It didn't quite work out that way. So Origin was really special. You know, skipping around a little bit, Ion Storm was pretty amazing. I mean, boy, talk mm -hmm. about a place that had ups and downs. I never wanted to make anybody my bitch, you know. <laughs> um, that that advertising campaign yeah. was horrible. <laughs> and there were all sorts of things that were crazy at, at Ion Storm that I, I will never talk about it <laughs> until I write my autobiography, which I will never do after I no longer care about working ever again. <laughs> But uh, the Austin office where we were working on Deus Ex was, was completely separate. We had our own culture. Again, I don't mean to speak ill of, of the guys in Dallas. John Romero is an amazing human being who cares more about games than anybody I've ever met and who gave me a, a chance that not many people get. So I have nothing but love for that guy. But we had a completely different culture and again, our own philosophy mm. that we were allowed to express. So Ion Storm, the ups and downs were pretty dramatic, you know, especially when IDOS acquired Ion Storm, there was a lot of pressure to just make a shooter. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot of me saying no, a lesson I learned from Chris Roberts, actually, the way to win a negotiation is to be willing to say no and if you don't win, you don't get your way to walk away. Mm. So I, I learned that lesson. Uh, very valuable, very risky. But, you know, IDOS was a great place to work, too, because they saw the potential of what we were doing and left my team alone, essentially. So that was very special. What isn't special is having your emails published in a newspaper in Dallas. That was painful. Mm. But anyway, there was that. Junction Point was really special, too. Mm. Um, it was a startup. I got to do exactly what I wanted, build a team I wanted. Uh, I was working with the Creative Artists Agency. I had an agent at that point. And mm. they wanted to change the way games were funded and, and published. And it would have been really spectacular. Uh, I mean, the approach they wanted to take was remarkable and... Uh, it didn't quite happen, but even so, I got to work with John Wu, you know, the film director. I got to work with other, you know, Hollywood types, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, and as as an equal, not as, you know, someone who's subservient or licensing what they're doing. It was, you know, creating something in, in collaboration with them for uh, working in a variety of media. That was pretty special. But then... Getting acquired by Disney, there's a picture of me when I was probably a year old, two years old, maybe. No, it was about a year, sitting in my mother's lap, wearing mouse ears. And so, you know, when I got the, the opportunity to work with Disney, her response was, you know, it wasn't, are you crazy? It wasn't, congratulations. It was, it's about time. Mm. And and that pretty much sums it up, you know. I had to. I mean, my my team at Junction Point. We were working on 
an epic fantasy role-playing game about dragons and magic coming back to the world and, you know, deep immersive sim uh, in an open world. That's what we were working on, that and a modern-day ninja game with John Woo. And I had to come back to that team and say, hey, folks, we're doing a Mickey Mouse game. (laughs) And... I lost some very talented people. <laughs> I was going to say, like, how did uh, I go down? <laughs> uh, well, my lead writer left and because he said, uh, I, I don't have that voice. I, I can't do mm. this. And a very talented level builder said, I want to make more serious games than that. Um, mm. And so they left. But by the end of the project, everybody was a Disney fan who stuck around uh, if they weren't when we started. But working with Disney was pretty amazing. It had horrific moments. I describe, I shouldn't say this either, but I describe my time at Disney as literally the best part of my career and the worst part of my career and nothing in the middle. It was an on-off switch. It was binary. But for the most part, as I look back on it, the parts that stay with me are the best. I'm happy doing what I'm doing, but if Disney asked me to come back, ooh, man, it would be hard to say no. It would be really hard. Mm. Um, so that's kind of my free forming. Oh, that's uh, great. I guess I would say Origin and Ion Storm and and Disney mm. kind of top the list. But everything has has ups and downs, you know. Yeah. I was going to ask you about Junction Point, actually. Uh, what happened to that Half-Life 2 episode? Yeah, the story of Junction Point is kind of interesting. Like I said, we were working on these amazing original IP, fantasy and, and modern day. And the CAA, let's change the world of video game development thing, went away. And when it went away, I was sitting in my office going, hey, man, I got like 13 people here that I have to pay <laughs> and our, our money just left. Hmm, mm-hmm. What am I going to do? And Gabe Newell, you know, bless him, got in touch. I don't know if he heard about it or if he just felt, hey, let's go see if they want to work with us. They were doing their episodic thing. Gabe asked if I wanted to do a Half-Life episode. And heck yeah. I mean, first I needed to keep my team together, but you know, I was a huge Half-Life fan and Half-Life 2. Oh man. I mean, they were great games and it still bugs me that there has never been a Half-Life 2. <laughs> so that's a whole other story. And so we, we started working on that. A couple of things happened. And again, I'm, I shouldn't be saying any of this, but it took us a while. It took my team a while to figure out how to use the source engine. I mean, you know, we were starting from scratch and we got to the point where I was really happy with what we were doing. And I even kind of arrogantly thought, you know, what we're doing here is actually might be better than what Val is doing. (laughs) Um, And pretty much at that moment, when we had just mastered the source engine and we're doing some really good work. We had, we created a new tool a new thing that I wanted to introduce into the the Half-Life universe. It would have, I think, made as much of a difference to to play as the gravity gun did, you know? Mm -hmm. And right when we got to that point, Valve decided they didn't want to do episodes anymore. So, you know, that went away. And again, I'm going, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, how are we going to do this? And... I managed to keep the the company afloat. I, I don't want to talk about how because it's kind of personal, yeah. not illegal. But it didn't involve <laughs> other companies, but uh, yeah. I I kept the company afloat, and I was still working with CAA. My agent, Seamus Blackley, the father of the Xbox, took me around, and you know I still had those other proposals in my back pocket, and so we went around and pitched to lots and lots of people and then he told me we should pitch to disney i just said you know you're crazy they're not going to be interested in m-rated 
fantasy role playing and modern day ninja games, and they weren't. Uh, but that that led to the Mickey Mouse game, and then yeah. finally that led to the acquisition and everything. So it it worked How out okay. About but that? The the reality is Valve decided not to do episodes anymore mm. just as we got good at it that's heartbreaking yeah i don't know where half-life 3 is i don't think anyone knows <laughs> in a um, way, they'd be crazy to do it i mean think how much it more makes expectations makes, makes for them you know yeah i think i don't know what is it like being acquired by disney was it hard was it like obviously it sounds like it came at a good time but what did it cost you in terms of you know like emotionally um that's an interesting question what happened was when i was pitching them they uh, you may have heard this before but it's it's still a i mean a funny story to me i was pitching sleeping giants and ninja gold and all of the executives in this room there were like a dozen of them started looking down at their phones and you know, typing away on their blackberries or whatever. Mm. And I was thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to kill Seamus because I'm wasting my time. And it turned out that what they were doing was texting each other, asking if they should show me their, their concept for a Mickey Mouse game. And they asked me and to make a long story short, I, I said, well, yes. I mean, I would love to be able to, I mean, what I was thinking is with Mickey Mouse, the most recognizable icon on planet Earth. I can sneak some of those immersive sim player empowerment ideas in and reach the mainstream audience with them. Hey, that's a pretty cool idea. So I said yes, and there were three of us, me, Alan Varney again, the guy I worked with on Tune, and a, a programmer, uh, Alex Duran. We did, uh, I don't remember how many months, a few months of concept development on what became Epic Mickey, building on what uh, the Disney guys had done, which as a foundation was pretty genius. I mean, what I told them was, they said, you don't have to use any of our ideas. And I just said, these are brilliant. I'd be crazy not to. You have given me an acorn and I am going to grow it into an oak tree. <laughs> um, so anyway, we did this concept development and they, they said, we love this. The way you get to make this game is we acquire you. And <laughs> they made me an offer and I knew I could do better. I mean, I, I had this vision of an exit strategy and how much I thought the company would be worth at the end of the day and all of that, you know, crummy, you know, you shouldn't have to think about it or you shouldn't think about it, but you do, you know. And I said, no. One of the guys I was talking to said, no, no one says no to Disney. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, well, I just did. I'm sorry. And again, I was able to keep the company afloat. And about a year later, they called me up and, and came back and said, you know, we've spent a year trying to get somebody to implement your design and we couldn't find anybody. And I said, well, that's interesting. Great. <laughs> they said, well, we want you to make it, but we have to acquire you. <laughs> and I said, no. And they said, wait a minute. Let us fly to Austin and we'll talk about it. So the next day, a Disney executive was in my office. Wow. And, and talking about it, to be frank, it was a better deal. And I, I thought to myself, how many times... Am I going to get the opportunity to live out a lifelong dream? It doesn't matter how much money you can make, you know, mm. like as long as you're making a living, why not do the thing you burn to do, you know? And so I said, yes. And they acquired the studio. Although the, the other funny thing was we were working on the contract, you know, and an acquisition contract and a, personal contract with me between me and the company and my agent Seamus uh, and Ophir Lupu who was another agent there that I was working with and they were negotiating on my behalf with Disney because as they put it you're the talent let us be the assholes mm. and and so 
they negotiated and got to the point where things were looking pretty good. And a decision was made to make the announcement at E3. And they were going to get a bunch of journalists, I mean, lots of journalists in a room at a hotel in a ballroom. And I was going to come out on stage and they were going to announce my, you know, the acquisition of Junction <laughs> and all that. And I still hadn't signed the contract. And so the journalists are filing in and I'm there with Disney executives standing outside the ballroom. I'm like out in the street and I've got a phone up to one ear talking to Seamus and a phone up to the other ear talking to my attorney and saying, what do I do? What do I do? And the Disney folks are saying, the journalists are in there waiting. <laughs> Sign. <laughs> and, it's, uh, you know, finally Seamus said, it's not perfect, but do you want to work with these guys? And I said, well, yes. <laughs> do you want to make this game? Yes. And he said, just sign. I signed the contract on the back of one of the Disney executives. And we walked in and the announcement got made. And, and that's how it happened. And I was, you know, emotionally, I was thrilled. I mean, here's this, mm. I mean, it's a Mickey Mouse game, you know? And working for Disney and a dream game. It was great. There was never a moment in those early days when I just said, wow, did I make a mistake? <laughs> that's, so good. Good. that's so good to hear that. I mean, I know obviously I know that sounds things you had moments of catastrophe before you moved out of, uh, out of Disney. How did this come about at Texas University? I had taught a master class in design and development at, at the University of Texas some years before. And in fact, the video of that class, all of the lectures and sessions, they're, they're up on YouTube. But what I did at that time was I would give an hour long lecture on some topic that interested me. <laughs> and then I browbeat friends in the industry to come in and I would interview them. And I loved it. I learned so much. I interviewed uh, Mike Moran from Blizzard and a, a you know, bunch of other people. Harvey at that time, I interviewed Harvey Smith, you know, and it was great. I was working on my PhD before I got into games in film. I had done a lot of teaching and, and really enjoyed it. So Junction Point got shut down. We were kind of the tip of the spear as, as uh, Disney was getting out of uh, internal development. But Junction Point got shut down. And I have to admit, that was crushing. I mean, if you want to talk about emotional devastation, that was it. It was by far the toughest thing I've gone through professionally, maybe in any aspect of my life, actually, now that I think about it. And I spent several months sitting on a couch with a, a remote control in my hand, changing the channels. And I wasn't even playing games. It was sad. I got a call out of the blue from the chairman of the RTF department, Radio TV Film. And he said, we're looking to start a game development program. Would you be interested in coming on board and building the program? We have nothing. I mean, it's an idea. Let's do game development. You know, I thought about it. And I talked to my wife, my rock, my, you know, my right arm. And she said, you should do this. You got to get up off the couch. You know? <laughs> and, and so I went and talked to them and to make a long story short, I, I signed on with UT decided that, you know, according to the entertainment software association, there were at the time and probably still are over 400 institutes of higher education teaching game development and game studies. Wow. And I said to myself, I don't want to just duplicate what they're all doing. They've been doing it for a while and they're going to do it better than me starting from scratch. So I, I thought about my own career and what we could do that wasn't being covered by other places and where I thought the industry could use some help. And what I came up with was let's put together a program that teaches 
business and creative leadership for game development and, you know, teaching the next generation of producers and company founders and executives at large companies, because I I think I've done literally everything it's possible to do in the game business. You know, I mean, I've designed, directed, produced, run studios, been acquired, uh, you know, run a team of of 10 and a team of 800, literally. (laughs) I mean, so I, I figured, hey, I could do this. I built the curriculum and did a bunch of lecturing. I did hire two other professors, uh, well, not professors. Uh, I insisted that my faculty have actual hands-on game development experience within the last three years before the program started because I am not happy, let's put it that way, that most of the people teaching game development in the world have never worked on a game. Really? Uh, Many of them have. But there are too many who haven't. And I wasn't going to go down that road. So I hired these guys. The way the program worked out, it was called the Denius Sam's Gaming Academy. And we got, you know, endowments from a couple of people, Denius and Sam's, as you might expect. And so what we were able to offer was a year tuition free two semesters, you don't pay, and we're only going to have 20 people. That's amazing. Uh, Yeah. And we would do lecturing in the morning. And in the afternoon, those 20 people were going to make games. They were basically going to be a little company and make games. And we would have rotating leaders. So everybody got a chance to be a creative and, you know, business leader using the lessons that we taught in the morning and it worked pretty well. I mean, we got at the end of two years, I said I would make a three-year commitment to the university and a year of developing the program and two years of the program running. And I said, you know, there are still things I want to make. And so I said, I, I, to the chairman of the department, I I've got to leave. And I did. And then, (laughs) The program fell apart. Oh my! And no longer exists, oh. which I feel a little guilty about. But you know that was that was kind of how it went. And I'm hugely proud of the the people who were in those the two classes, the two years. And we had 100 percent placement. Everybody in the program got a job making games or starting their own studios. Or a couple of them said. Wow, after doing this, there's no way I'm making games. <laughs> uh, but everybody who wanted a job got a, a job. That's so fantastic. That's I think it's mad that game development, I don't know if like in the UK it's still like this, but it's still not seen as seriously at an educational level. It's getting better, but not as seriously as other creative mediums like music and film and art. Like, And I think it's... Yeah, I just think it's incredibly, um, uh, I don't know, archaic in some ways. Like, I feel like considering how many people we reach. And do you a, a couple of things about that. First of all, Ian Livingstone, who's a friend and, you know, was at IDOS and was a big supporter of Deus Ex, he's really into education over there mm. in the UK and, yeah, we, and is yeah. doing a good job, looks mm. to me. The other thing is, this gets back to something I said earlier we're still a young medium. Uh, Mm -hmm. It may not feel that way to people who've survived for 38 years, (laughs) but we're still a young medium. And we're about where film was in the early 60s. In fact, I've been reading a bunch of, you know, film culture magazine and film quarterly magazine from 1962 and 63. I don't know why. I'm totally into it right now. Um, Such such a niche thing to be into. (laughs) You could could substitute the word video game for film in those magazines, and it it would track perfectly. And the things they were complaining about are exactly the kinds of things you're talking about. And so I think we'll get there. The people who make games still don't think what they're doing is important, and they don't think it's worth preserving I'm big in game preservation too. That's a whole other topic I'm happy to talk about. <laughs> but, 
Um, <laughs> you know, you know, we're still taking baby steps. Mm. And someday I think you'll see a lot more emphasis on education and training. You're yeah. already seeing that. I've hired lots of people out of game development programs now. Lots of them. Mm. So things are changing. I think they're getting better on that on that front. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's it's interesting you mentioned uh, Ian Mimsley because um, he was actually a guest on season one, and we spoke about his uh, his academies that he set up two academies in the UK, and he's just obviously worked with the government. And yeah, he's been like at the vanguard of video game development within the educational system here. I think it's I, I guess my pain comes because I have a son who's uh, fifteen and. He wasn't able to take computer science at school, at secondary school. So um, I think it's probably college in the US. And I was just really shocked because, like, I spoke to his teachers and thought, well, it should be a standard that he should have this, you know, ability to take computer science because if he wants yeah, to sure. pursue a career in programming, this is where he's going to get that. You should be encouraging kids to adopt new mediums and new technology. But yeah, so yeah, I think that's probably where my frustration with that comes from. But what more do you think could be done in the US specifically to help encourage educational institutes to promote video game development? Do you think they could be doing more, like taking it more seriously? Or do you think it's just, like you said, film culture in the 60s taking those baby incremental steps at the moment? I think in the US, there are people taking it seriously. I try not to talk about specific games and specific universities because I don't want people to be upset with me when I leave them out. But, you know, DigiPen, Guildhall, USC, there are plenty of places uh, mm. that are are doing a really good job. And I've hired from them, uh, from those places, lots of places. I mean, one of my favorite designers and game directors, Chase Jones, went to DigiPen. You know, I'm not working with him now. I'm very sad about this. Chase, if you're listening, please come home. Um, you know, there are places doing a really good job. There are two issues. One is there's kind of a lack of commitment. You know, doing two courses is not going to help anybody. And there's also confusion about where game development education should live. It should it be in the art department. Should it be in computer science? Should it be in radio, TV, film? Should mm. it be in architecture? I mean, all of those are valid. And it's different everywhere. Nobody yeah. really knows. And there's no standardization. So that's one problem. The other is what I said a minute ago. You've got a lot of people teaching who've never done it. Mm. And one of the things that I haven't seen this yet too much, but I suspect we'll see it before too long. I've got a lot of gray hair. You know, this is an audio thing, so you can't see it. But there's a lot of gray up there now. There are, I mean, developers are, are getting older. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I used to work crazy hours and I used to live for playing games. And it gets harder as you get older. My last project, I had the horrifying realization and had to have the terrible talk with my team and say, you know, you're not going to believe this, but someday you will. Your body really does change. Physically, you change as you get older. And I can no longer work the hours I used to. And there may be times I used to have a rule. If anybody on my team is in the office, I'm in the office with them. And I had to tell them, I can't do that anymore. So there are going to be unfair times when you're going to be here and I'm going to be home sitting on a couch flipping the channels, you know? And what that means, I don't think I'm alone in that. But what that means is there are going to be more people who say, I've done this long enough. I know a lot. I'm going to convey that to the next generation. And so I think you're going to see more people who've done it teaching how to do it. The key for them is going to be keeping up with things that change very rapidly. These kids today live in a very different world than Richard and Chris and I lived in, you know, 30 years ago. But I think you're going to see more professionals teaching. And I think mm -hmm. that'll help, too. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think maybe that should be, you know, the minimum. I almost feel like it's passion. You know, if you're going to teach something, then you should live and breathe it, right? Because yeah. passion counts for so much, right? I think you can, like, majority of things you can learn in life, but you can't teach someone passion for a subject. They can learn passion. If, uh, if you're not passionate about making, <laughs> making games, this is crushingly hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. you, will, you will not survive if you don't love doing yeah. it. I've actually, when I was working with guys out in L.A. during the early Junction Point days, people would look at me and say, man, what we do is really hard. And you don't want us looking at your animation because we'll be really tough on you. And it's like, just think, what you do isn't hard. I've been on movie sets. I was a film guy. <laughs> what we do is hard, you know. <laughs> and there was one time I even said, we have to do 30 frames a second, which dates this story. Now you have to do 60. But we have to do 30 frames a second. What you do, a frame every 30 hours. I don't want to hear how tough what you do is, <laughs> you know. We have to reinvent the camera pretty much every time we make a game. Mm. In your medium, the position of the sprocket holes hasn't changed in 100 years. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to hear it. So you better be passionate about it. As you well. better be passionate. <laughs> oh, okay, well, that, was, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Warren, for obviously part one. Uh, it's been a brilliant journey. Very much looking forward to recording part two with you. Well, thanks for having me. This has been great. All of the views and uh, opinions today expressed are those of Warren's and mine and do not reflect our employers in any, any shape, <laughs> way, or form. Boy, <laughs> is that true. Holy cow. <laughs> and if you want to reach out to us, you can at the game dev show at ptw.com. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Warren. Thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Game over.